Thank you. I had a wonderful time with Rob. Again. He told me, he came in to tell me. That well, I had, I had a session with, with Rob. Time. Paying attention. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <sighs> Billy Crystal is with us. What a pleasure to see you again. Nice to see you. It means Thank I'm working. You. It means I'm working. What do you mean? You haven't stopped working. No, this is, a, this, is, this is a good one. I like this one. You know what? I like it too. Oh, good. White man's overbite. I know. I put that in there. 30 seconds. Long enough. Would you like to explain what I'm referring to, Billy? No. You wouldn't? No. You don't want to spoil the suspense close to prostrating of the movie. Harry says to Sally, at one point when, when they meet early in their relationship, well, this is now six years after they met, that he says that uh, he can't, he has to leave because women like to be held uh, too long. He said, what do you like to be held? All night, right? He says, after he has sex with the woman, he says, uh, you know what goes through a man's mind? How long do I have to lie here and hold it before I can get up and go home? Is 30 seconds enough? Well, and he's, he says these strange things, but they're true, and they're real to people, and he's outrageously funny, and I love playing this guy. And it's a pleasure to watch you playing this guy. Oh, great. I don't remember an actor having more fun with hair, beard, appearance and going through the kind of transition Harry goes through based on his appearance and at the end of the movie you look younger than you did when you started. Yeah, And, and you I know, said Billy's working out again, he's keeping trim. But, <laughs> but you know what, he's happier and he's come through this long journey, this 12 year journey of finding himself and he does and what I love about it, it's not until the last few minutes of this movie that he does. And that's what makes this a great movie. It's about two people, one of them changes, reluctantly. I think it's wonderful watching you as Harry, knowing that you have been, I presume, in front of you, a happily married man for yes. almost two decades. Yes. That one of your daughters is older than the relationship in this movie is. It's very true. <laughs> and yet you come in with all you know about the character. And by the way, an actor without a script is an actor without words. And to have Nora Ephron writing this screenplay after Rob Reiner and Andy Scheinman, to use the right phrase, spilled their guts to her <laughs> and told her everything about mm -hmm. their lives. And yet you walk in and add your dimensions, your input. Why, in your opinion, I asked Rob this, why did Rob wait so long to give you the role and say, but Billy, I had to speak to other people. I couldn't just give it to you out of friendship. Right. I think that's why. I think he had to go through the process. Uh, and I came to it at the perfect time. They were in a stall. I don't know if Rob told, I don't know what he told you, but I came in when they were sort of sitting around going, now where, what? And he called me and said, God, I feel bad about this. And, you know, I always wanted you, but this. he had to make sure. And I was dying. I, you know, I knew about this, but I hadn't read it. And then when I read it, I liked it. I loved its potential. So when I came into the room, I had a list of things. How about we can do this? And so much of Harry is input that I had to Nora. Now she heard another guy talking. You know, and then Meg came on, and she had her point of view. So the perfect scenario for the way we worked was I just keep spritzing. I take an idea and make it longer. The Sheldon thing was one reference in the script. I went, I made that little run. And I would do something here, and I'd do something there. And Meg came in with the idea for faking the orgasm scene. And she said, I want to talk about it. Well, and we said, well, it's got to be in a public place. So Rob and Nora worked out that dialogue. And then I had to, I wrote the last line. I'll have what she's having. But that's how the four of us worked, you know, throughout the film. Uh, why he waited so long, I don't know. What did he say? What did he say to you? Pretty close to what you just said. Okay. I think I came in with fresh ideas and a fresh slant uh, and new energy for the time that hopefully you know, kicked it Billy, up. when you read the first the, the script the first time, did Harry and Sally drive from Chicago to L.A.? No. They were already driving from Chicago, Chicago to, to New York. York. Yeah. I we changed the car. Right. You did? What was it originally? <laughs> okay. Come on. We can handle it. Canada can handle this news. It wasn't Canadian. No. <laughs> it wasn't. I told Rob that he has managed with his cinematographer to make New York look so romantic, which is important. Yes, it is. Since it they're blind to everything but each other, and the distance. Yes. New York looks so romantic, so clean, so loving, that I thought the movie had been shot in Toronto. I was just going to say, yeah, we <laughs> shot it in Toronto. No, it's New York. It's of course, we're so used to Toronto being someplace else. I say to people, you know, stop it. Just say we're in Toronto now. Yeah. But New York hasn't looked that good probably since the Eddie Duchin story. 
<laughs> when, when Kim Novak ran, ran toward Tyrone Power. And I always love moments when people run toward each other. That's you know, true. Well, I run towards it. Oh, do you run? You know, and I run towards it. It's and That's when I knew you were in shape. And who do I run with? What, what am I listening to? What is the audience listening to? The King, Sinatra. And there's nothing more romantic than running to, to somebody you know you love while you're listening to Frank Sinatra. I think that's what love is. I think when you realize you should you know love, after 20 years of marriage. I think when you really love somebody, you hear Frank Sinatra. What do you play when you're running toward Janice, your wife? Shake your booty. I don't know. Some, some Great balls like of fire. That. Wow. Watch yourself. No, Jerry Lee Lewis. Listen. Oh, okay. It's one of the other movies for the summer of 89. Right. You know what I told Meg Ryan? What? I felt watching her work with you and the wonderful support that is received from Carrie Fisher, oh, Bruno Kirby. Oh, great. Very important. They're great. You know, it's like the Gig Young role and the Eve Arden role. Okay. Or Thelma Ritter, younger. Yes. And they're there with the right line for yeah. the right moment, yeah. and it all comes together. But I told Meg Ryan that I thought after working with Marty Short, Eugene Levy, and John Candy, there was an honorary maple leaf somewhere on her body, and that comedy had somehow permeated her soul, and she was ready for you. Oh, uh, good. She's a unique talent, and I, we're like the, I don't know, we're, we looked at her once, you know, we're like the Burns and Allen of the 90s here. There's a great chemistry between the two of us that happened from the first time we met, and, you know, I'm really fortunate. She's just really something. It was real exciting to, to feel we're all growing on this one, you know, and for me, I just, I look up and I can see a man on screen. There's also a palpable sexual tension happening while we wait 11 years watching this movie. You felt it? Oh yeah, it's there. It's there. And, and you I know what's nice? And when, and when they do do it, there's no music on there. And you hear the sound of the kissing and stuff. And that's what you would hear if you were in the room with them. You know what I mean? And I think that's pretty hot. Heartbeats have good rhythms too. It's a pleasure seeing you again. It's always good to see you. Thank you, Billy. Bye. Billy Crystal. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.